pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker in the Sustainability Speaker Series. Beth Carlin is a graduate student in the School of Social Ecology here at UCI. Her interest lies in bringing to bear principles and insights from the behavioral sciences into the realm of environmental policy and programs. Many of you may be familiar with research she's carrying out on the psychological dimensions of energy conservation. She also has worked on document fulfillment as a force of social change. Prior to starting her career as a, as a PhD student, she was uh, a teacher in the public school system. Uh, it's a pleasure to have her here tonight to speak about the psychology of sustainability. development, um, the brain, and or behavior at the individual level. So psychology is much broader, is inclusive of therapy and a clinical setting, but is actually much broader than that. My work is in a subfield of psychology called environmental psychology. And environmental psychology has been defined in a number of ways over the years. The top um, first and most famous thing definition is by Professor Dan Sokols, who's my advisor here at UC Irvine, and one of the founders of the field. Um, but in general, environmental psychology deals with the relationships between humans and the environment, the environmental impact, the impact of, the, of our environment on our behavior, and then people's impact on the environment. And then our impact on the environment, the impact of our impact on the environment back on us, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, but environmental psychology is very broad. It deals not just with sustainability, but it also deals with things like whether we study better in red rooms or yellow rooms, um, how many people in an elevator leads the average person to feel crowded versus just a little bit um, uncomfortable, traffic conditions, all sorts of things involving anything in the natural or built environment that impacts the human psyche or human behavior. So to look at, to become even more specific, from psychology to environmental psychology to sustainability, that requires yet another definition. So what is sustainability? And those of you who are participating in our sustainability seminar series or course are very familiar with some of these definitions. Um, in general, sustainability is the ability for anything, the capacity to endure, for anything to sustain or continue. And the most prominent definition of environmental sustainability was coined by a group called the Brundtland Commission, which was formed by the United Nations in the late 80s. And they said that environmental sustainability is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And that, that definition, and I tend to not like to read um, off the slides because I think most people who attend talks can read, but I, I think that's a really important definition. Um, and so, and I like to say it out loud because I think it's beautiful too. So environmental sustainability, you see the word environment isn't anywhere in there, but it's, it's meeting the needs of our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations. And, and it's really an interesting definition because of what they left out. Um, they didn't use the word environment, and they didn't just read humans, just meeting the needs of the present, whatever present needs are as defined, without compromising future needs relatively unified as well. And then the third definition I'm really excited to share because, because I'm easily excited, and also because I just got an email this week on Monday from the National Academies of Science. And the National Academies of Science just said we are launching a new section 
of the journal, the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science, PNAS, in sustainability science. And they define sustainability science as, as you can see, as the emerging field of research dealing with the interaction between natural and social systems. This is really, really exciting for somebody who studies social science and the social science aspects of sustainability. They're focusing not just on engineering, not just on physics, but the interactions between natural and social systems. And they said that is what sustainability science is. It's not just one, not just the other, but the interactions between the two. So hopefully I've made my point fairly clear, which is that psychology and sustainability does make sense as a term. These are not mutually exclusive, and it is a field worthy of study. People are impacting the environment, we're using natural resources, we're being affected by our environments, and there's something we can do about it. And psychology as a study of humans, human behavior, human mind, um, is in a perfect place to do this. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And I'm not the only person who thought this. The American Psychological Association a few years ago convened a task force to study the interface between psychology and global climate change. And I'm gonna use that task force report as kind of an outline for my talk today, and I'm gonna highlight, it's very long. Anyone who's interested in this field should definitely read it. Um, it's really interesting, and it talks about how the past century or so of psychology can be applied and is being applied to study global climate change. But I'm gonna use the outline from their report um, and highlight some of, what I, some of what I think are kind of the most interesting um, and most promising and most fun to talk about research areas in this field. So they published this report, Psychology and Global Climate Change, and they identified six key areas in the study that psychology can contribute to the study of global climate change. And they, they phrase them in the form of questions. How do people understand what is the public's general understanding of climate change? What are the behavioral contributions to climate change and the psychological and contextual drivers of these changes? What are the psychosocial, psychological and social impacts of climate change? on human populations? How are people adapting and coping with the perceived threat of climate change? What are the psychological barriers to action to prevent or mitigate climate change? And how can psychology contribute to intervening to change behavior? So I'm going to start with, um, with the first. What is people's understanding of climate change? How do people, how do the general public understand climate change. Um, and one of, I think, the most interesting theories is kind of an evolutionary theory, and it's called the, the theory of the risk thermostat. And the theory of the risk thermostat says that, that there are certain conditions under which we respond most clearly and most immediately to threat. Um, so threat response is highest when the following, um, when the following criteria are met. And I like to think, um, and looking at the first one, simple causality, I like to use analysis, I like examples. So when I think of threat response and when threat response is highest, and I looked over this list and I thought, what's a good example, um, kind of a physical example that I can use? And, and um, I'm not sure how many of you all relate to this, but um, there was a show called The Brady Bunch. Does anybody know The Brady Bunch? And there's this classic scene in The Brady Bunch where one of the Brady boys, there's, there's a mother, she's a lovely lady, she has two girls, she's got a few boys. And, um, and they all came together and formed a family in the Brady Bunch. And there was, there was this key scene in the Brady Bunch when one of the brothers were playing football and they threw this football at the oldest sister, Marsha. And the football came straight at her and it hit her in the face and she goes, oh, my nose! And then she got a big, you know, she just like stubbed bloody nose, like huge, nobody wanted to ask her out. It's really sad for Marsha, it's a good episode, you should look it up on YouTube. Um, and that's a great example of when threat response is highest. So the cause was really simple. There was this giant football, and it was careening towards Marsha's nose. It was a really simple cause. So there was this threat, and the threat was a football in the air at great speed. Simple causality, easy to identify. There was probably some historical precedent. I don't think that Marsha has ever been hit in the nose with a football before, but there was some sort of historical precedent. We've all seen sports. We know that balls can fly at people's faces and hit them. We're all familiar with footballs. And we have some sort of idea of when a football hits you in the face might be a win. It's visible. It's very obvious. You can see the football coming at your face when it's coming at you. Um, and it's pretty obvious that it is heading in your direction or not heading in your direction. Sometimes you might not know if it's an inch or two in either direction, but if somebody throws something at you, you can see it generally coming if you're looking up. There are immediate consequences. 
If anyone has ever been hit in the face with a ball, you know that it hurts. Immediately, immediately it hurts. Um, and for the next few days, it will probably continue to hurt. In addition, it's caused by another. There is something that threw that football at Arsha. It was one of her brothers. I think it was Bobby Brady. I could be wrong. But there was an other, a person, something with a face. I think, although it's less likely that a dog or a bear throw a football at Marcia, at a Brady or anyone else, but if a, if a bear had thrown a football at us, we might have the similar reaction. If a football just came careening from the sky, that might be a little bit strange. We're not prepped to really deal with threat in that way. And, um, and it had a direct impact. When that football hit Marcia in the face, it actually hit her and impacted her. It didn't impact anyone else. And that's kind of how we're trained to respond to threat. But as you can see on the right, climate change is none of those things. The cause is complex. There's tons of things that different people are doing all over the place to contribute to climate change. Um, it's unprecedented. We've really never seen anything like this before. Even looking at these charts, we know that there's been some um, deviation in global temperatures, but not to the extent that we're being told it's happening now. It's slightly imperceptible. The impacts are unclear. We're not sure the causes are kind of all of ours, not just one person. And the impacts um, are not direct, at least not right now for most of us. So there are a few questions. So looking at this first thermostat, there are a few questions that, that we might ask ourselves about why um, we might or might not be perceiving climate change as a serious threat. Um, one is, can I tell that it's happening? So a lot like this frog, um, slowly cooking in a pot, we might not notice changes as they're happening. Um, and even though we can see that they're, that we can see on a chart that they're changing, um, we might not be that concerned. We don't feel these deviations in temperature over a period of years. And we don't think about, this isn't going to ruin my day. This might ruin my, um, my day 50 years from now, but not today. Um, we're much more concerned with this weather report. And um, just so you know, this is the weather that turns is supposed to rain. This is Irvine, just so you know. And really, let's be honest, that bothers you a lot more than the slide you just saw. You don't have to admit it, but you kind of felt a little different. Like, oh, rain. Damn. Um, and then, we already talked about this, but does it have a face? And I know we already, I already talked about this, I just really like this scary picture of this jar. And although I thought it contributed very little content to my presentation, I didn't want to take it out because um, <laughs> I, I don't know why, it really scares me. Um, but it does make a point because, because that shark we respond to in a really different way, in kind of a visceral or affective way that we don't to these smokestacks on the right. And that's because there are two forms, two kind of processing that, are about, that we engage in in our mind. And those are affective and cognitive processing. So the affective domain is kind of that feeling, gut level, immediate fight or flight response, risk thermostat side of us. And we really respond to grief, to threat when it, when it um, affects us affectively. The cognitive part is the thinking, rational, analytic part of our brain, and it responds to threat if only after it's been able to chew on it a little bit. Um, our affect largely is considered a little bit stronger when it comes to um, how we engage, actually engage in day-to-day, moment-to-moment -day -moment 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 behavior. So some of those differences um, we've already talked about. Affect is fast, it's automatic, it's emotional, it comes from experience. And it's, it's uh, and we're thinking about things that are happening right now in front of us. That's affect. What's going on? That shark really affects me affectively because it looks like it's going to chew my face off. Right now, not in 20 years. Now, he's coming at me. Whereas the cognitive side is slow and learned, it's deliberative, we think about things, statistics, those graphs, the plumes, like I know that that stuff going into the air is bad. I, I know that, but that shark is so scary in a very different part of my body or my mind when we respond differently to that. So um, we can cognitively appraise something. Like you can look, this is a really famous image, it's called the Keeling Curve. And when you look at it, and you think about it, and you, you look and see that, that the carbon concentration in parts per million in the Earth's atmosphere has gone up from 310 to 380, and it's continuing to rise. And 
And when you think about it, that's kind of scary, carbon. I don't understand. Is that it's bad in the atmosphere, global warming? I read something about that in the Daily Show. And you can kind of like think that that's not a good thing. But if while you're looking at that chart, a mouse runs up, you might respond in a really different way, and you might jump or freak out. For some of you, it's a spider or a snake. For me, it was the shark. I'm not going to lie, that shark scares me. But the point is that even though um, we can cognitively process things, our affective response pushes us into action so much faster than that feeling or than that cognition does. So that's just a little bit, um, a little bit about, uh, about how we respond to some of the issues with, with how our basic understanding of climate change. Like I said, I'm in no way comprehensive. I would rather talk in more detail about a few things um, and encourage everyone to read that slide that they do. It's a lot more talk to me than, than talk about every possible aspect of, of our psychological understanding of climate change. So I'm going to move on to behavioral contributions. Um, how are humans contributing to climate change? And what are the contextual barriers of those? So the big picture that we're all pretty familiar with is that life support resources are declining and our use of them is increasing. So there's less stuff and there's more use of that stuff. And that is a problem. That's what we're told. Um, and one way of calculating that is called the IPAT model. And IPAT says that the envir environmental impact of any given population is a function of the population, the number of people in the population, times the consumption per person, times the technological impact per person. So I'm going to focus on population and consumption. So IPAT, or IPA, if I have heard the T, which I'm choosing to do, means that our impact, our environmental impact, is a function of the population times the consumption per person in any given country or region. So um, even though so there are differences in those. So uh, we know that our population is increasing. We hear about this all the time. What's equally important is that overall population growth is where that growth is taking place. Most of the population growth in the past 60 years, continuing in the next 50 years, is coming from developing countries. Um, now, if you think about the IPAP model, that's kind of a good thing because, um, as we'll talk about, they use a little bit less resources than we do. But, um, but that means that as these countries develop, that there's this tendency, even as population stabilize, for consumption to go up. So, where population growth is not equal, we can see certain countries are completely stable, have zero population growth, mostly in Western Europe. Um, there are countries that are approaching zero population growth, America is one of them. And then there are countries that are still rapidly um, increasing in population. And you might wonder what that has to do with psychology. And a couple things just to think about um, is that population growth we see does stay as countries move from developing to developed. And we see that, um, that there's high correlations with stemming population growth with decreased infant and child mortality, the availability of contraception, urbanization, and political stability. Um, and so there is a lot of effort in psychology studying gender roles, reproductive rights, um, beliefs about population growth, um, government control, and, um, and other issues that might have, that may impact population growth. Um, but population growth is only one, one aspect because even as we stem population growth, as countries become more developed, their population might decrease or might reach zero population growth. But in general, the amount that's consumed per person is likely to increase at a much greater rate than population growth is likely to decrease. So the overall, if you remember that, population times consumption per person, even if population stems, if consumption per person continues to rise, or rises beyond that, that um, decrease, then we'll still see a larger overall use of resources in a country. And right now, even though our developed countries are less than 20% of our world's population, we're using almost 80% of the world's resources. So as countries become more politically stable and urbanized, and we said one of the key factors in stemming population growth is urbanization, and urbanization tends to lead to an increase in resource consumption. So, um, so, so those numbers might not look um, as good, even though we're stemming population growth. So, um, and the United States is at the top, is at the head of the pack. We use a lot. We use 25% of the world's arable land, even though we're a very small percentage of the population. I think we're about 8% of the population. 
legislation. And if some countries, large and growing countries like China and India, were to approach our ecological footprint in terms of how of per person consumption, um, we would be uh, in a lot of trouble. We might already be, I don't know. I haven't read the news lately, I heard we are. But, um, but it would be worse. So, um, so we need to think about consumption, not just population consumption. What are we consuming? How are we consuming? And what are these, what factors are driving consumption and what are things we can do about it? So a lot of predictors of consumption um, occur at the contextual level, right? Land use, um, media, advertising, norms, structures. It's really hard, a lot of people say, it's really hard to go with other people are, especially in Southern California, all the people that say that, guys. Um, some people do, I went three months without them. I try and only drive one to two days a week. Um, but it, it, it is hard. So there are structural issues, there are governmental issues that affect um, how, how we consume. If you're in a, if you live in a city that doesn't let you have chickens in your backyard, let you grow your own food, or you can't afford a house with a yard, and uh, you might need to go to the grocery store to buy your food. So you're gonna obviously increase your ecological footprint just by the fact that we're purchasing food as opposed to growing it ourselves. So there are contextual barriers that affect our consumption. And then there are individual drivers. There are a lot of individual factors that affect how we consume and how much we consume. Age, gender, our knowledge, perception, our motivation, there are a lot of individual differences. So you might have two people that live in identical homes and, they're, um, and they, they live in an identical city and they have the identical commute to work, but their ecological footprint is wildly different because of some sort of um, attitudes, beliefs, age, one has kids in the house, one doesn't, one's vegetarian, one takes the bus. So there are a lot of individual differences as well. And then levels three and two refer to two primary different kinds of consumption. Um, one is economic consumption, and that's, and we're talking about consumption, consumption of resources. And that's the consumption of resources, the indirect consumption of resources through purchased goods. So if I buy a t-shirt, there's actually a lot of resources went into the t-shirt, not just the cotton to produce the t-shirt, but petroleum that fueled the, the truck and or boat that got the t-shirt to me and um, any food that fed the workers that made the t-shirt. There are a lot of different um, forms of, of resources that go into anything that we consume. And that is that does use natural resources. But there's also our direct and environmental consumption at level two, which is our immediate use of fossil fuels through electricity, through driving, natural gas, etc. We often think a lot more of level two as our consumption and forget sometimes about that indirect use, but anything you buy or consume also has um, consumption. And then that gets us down to um, actual emissions, which is level one. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about, um, about one piece of research, uh, talking about the difference in, in level two, kind of the connection between level four individual drivers and, um, and level two environmental consumption and, and how some of these differences and, and the importance of looking at some of these differences from a psychological perspective. Um, so conservation, when we talk about energy conservation, we're actually talking about not one, but many behaviors in the goal. Um, one example is lighting. When we turn on, when, when if you choose, when you press that over, I didn't realize there were still owners of that plug. Um, when you choose to, uh, if you wanted to save energy through life choices, you can either turn off lights when you leave a room, or you can change your light bulb. You can actually do both. But these are really different, these are these could be very different behaviors psychologically and contextually. Turning off lights every time you leave a room is referred to as a curtailment behavior. So it's routine, repeated, habitual changing in behavior is a curtailment behavior. As opposed to an efficiency behavior, which is a one-time or rare structural upgrade, changing your light bulb, installing a solar panel, buying a fuel-efficient car, getting rid of your car, getting a bus pass, versus um, unplugging things at night, choosing not to buy a new computer and using your old one for another year, versus unplugging your computer at night when you leave the office. These are both very good behaviors, but they are different. And so um, I'm going to talk just briefly about some research that, um, that some colleagues and I did last year, looking at the differences between personal and efficiency behavior. So what we did was we had an online, we distributed an online survey to about 800, a little over 800 people, and we asked them, do you engage in these behaviors, personal and efficiency? And we asked the three personal behaviors on the top and the five efficiency behaviors on the bottom. To what extent do you engage in or do you engage in, in these behaviors? 
And then we also asked them a series of questions um, from those levels, from level four. We asked a series of questions about um, demographics, age, race, gender, marital status, housing status, and then we also asked them psychological questions to see, is there a difference? Are these behaviors actually motivated by totally different things? Are there different influences to these types of behaviors? Because understanding that might help us better intervene to address those, to change those behaviors. And we did find some really interesting differences. So first, looking at demographics, we saw that efficiency behavior was much better predicted by age, race, and income, um, and mostly whether a person rents or owns their home. That really makes sense. Whether you engage in efficiency, those are the structural changes to a home, might be a function of whether you own the home. And then some other things that correlate with the ability to pay for those changes, like age and income. Um, and we see a huge, huge um, percentage of that, 31% um, of the variance, the variance in, um, in efficiency behavior is accounted for by these demographic and contextual changes. Whereas for curtailment, the total variation is just over 10%, and very little of that is demographic. It's mostly um, home size and number of people in the home. And those are negatively correlated. So the more number of people, so the more people in the home, the less likely those curtailed behaviors are to take place. Right? If you've got 10 people in the home, lights are probably off a little bit less than if it's just you and your dog. Uh, and then psychologically, we also saw some differences in that efficiency behaviors were much, much less likely to be predicted by psychological factors, whereas those curtailment, those daily habitual behaviors were more motivated or more, or more correlated with um, environmental attitudes. So, uh, so we do see that these different predictors of behavior could potentially lead us to different models of behavior. So, um, so there might be different ways that we can address and encourage these different types of behavior. So moving on to psychosocial impacts of climate change. How is climate change affecting us? So we talked just now about how we, we talked about how we understand climate change, how we contribute to climate change, and how what, how is climate change possibly impacting humans? We learn we know a lot about the physical impacts. We hear about them all the time on the news. We hear about the polar bears. That's really sad. I think he's got a ball soon. Um, yeah, so cute. I know. Sad um, so we know that there are a lot of potential physical impacts, but there are also psychosocial impacts of climate change. And there are a lot of negative psychosocial impacts. Um, we have a, there are emotional reactions. People respond very, very differently to climate change. Some people feel um, guilty and do something about it. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of apathy, denial, numbing. So there are emotional responses when people hear about the science of climate change. There are a lot of potential mental health impacts, um, especially in areas that have already been affected or that are being more significantly affected by climate change. When we look at a lot of populations in the small island nations, and there are a lot of small island nations in the world that um, the scientific evidence is pretty clear that they're not going to be able to live there for another century or so. Um, and so imagine if like, you were told that America was going to be underwater, and your family has lived, lived here for hundreds of years, and at some point, everyone, not just you, but everyone in your country is going to have to move. And we don't know where you're going yet. There's this group at the UN that's talking about it. And they'll let you know. At some point. Maybe. If it gets really bad, which we think it will. That's kind of stressful, right? Okay? Like just saying it makes my heart go up a little bit. Um, and so there are these psychosocial impacts that we need to understand because there are people, and they're not us in our time, but there are people that are living right now with that. For us, the, the impacts, like we talked about, climate change are still fairly indirect, and we're lucky right now, um, but it's not that way for everyone. There are people that are being directly um, impacted. So possibility of displacement, so that's social and cultural, like possibility of displacement and relocation, heat-related illness, and intergroup violence. So a lot of um, 
a lot of people really think that that there's a large percentage of intergroup violence, especially in um, in areas of Sub-Saharan Africa, is actually um, caused by underlying issues of limited resources. And it looks like that's going to increase. So understanding the psychosocial impacts, understanding how this impacts people, how limited resources and dealing with limited resources, how people uh, can overcome these without violence is really important. Uh, so I'm going to back to those emotional reactions away from the, the cultural. And, uh, and there's a, a classic coping theory um, by a woman named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And in the 60s, she came up with um, the five stages of grief. And, and she actually studied people who were dying of terminal illnesses and their families. And she said, there are five stages that we go through when, I, when we find out that we are dying or when a loved one has died. And, um, and uh, more recently, um, that's been applied to, to climate, to climate grief. So um, a lot of these are kind of recognizable. And so it's possible, it's like psychologists are still looking at how, um, if you move through this phase or how you respond in these ways, how these emotional responses to, um, to climate change are, are taking place. And, and they all seem kind of familiar, I think. Um, we've probably heard most of these statements on the news or said by somebody around us. Or we might have thought them. I know sometimes um, I hope that, that technology will fix these problems. You know, we talk about alternative energy so that we keep playing PlayStation and watching TV and buying new iPhones when they come out. I think the phone's coming out soon. Somebody told me that. And I want to not want it. I really do. And I tell myself it'll be okay because we're working on more sustainable battery sources. And uh, and I have to say, forming a new iPhone is that bad. We all burden. Um, this isn't just a um, one-sided issue. Um, that there are people that are anti-climate change, and then there's us that are on this side. I think even as individuals recognizing the fact that we're going through these processes help us kind of rationalize and think about. Um, think about how we're dealing with, with climate change in our own ways, because we all are dealing with it or not dealing with it, but that's dealing with it too. Um, so hopefully, at some point, we move through to acceptance, and psychologists are looking at how we can deal with these, these different stages and, and barriers and how we can move people towards acceptance and, um, and engaging um, in positive progressive solutions. So, and then just one other, um, I thought, interesting list of like common denial strategies that we can that we can probably all relate to um, either in ourselves or in others um, a lot of them a lot of them are similar to, to the stages of grief um, the bystander effect is another really classic psychological theory that's now being applied a lot to climate change and the bystander effect is that idea that i think someone else will take care of me i don't really need to if i stand around long enough and they've done studies um, in other areas where um, they've looked at the number of people standing around, if somebody drops like a ton of papers, the more people that are standing around, the less likely any one person is to help pick up those papers. The same thing with strength motorist. If you've ever thought to yourself, like you're on like this quiet desert road and your car breaks down, you're like, I wish I was on a 405, so I'd be okay. You're actually more likely to be helped on a strand desert road and on the 405 in rush hour because everyone on the 405 in rush hour thinks that someone else is going to help you. And they have better things to do than help you. But if they drive by and they think, no one's going to help that person but me, they're more likely to help you. And it's really easy with, with climate change to think that there's somebody else that's going to do something about it. Um, and there probably is, but this is a big problem. And so we want to look at ways that we can um, but there are also some positive psychosocial impacts to climate change, we think. Um, and that sounds strange. But a lot of us have really become not only accustomed to consumption, but we've grown quite fond of it. And we receive a lot, a lot of our psychological need, needs are being met currently through consuming things. Buying a pretty dress makes me feel pretty. Feeling pretty makes me feel good. Makes me feel loved and desired. And I get self-esteem next. 
needs met, and I paint him if he needs met. But it's really just a piece of fabric, right? And I'll go up that dress as needs my FC needs. Um, we love our televisions, and we love our cars, and so many of our emotional needs are met through buying things and having things and replacing those things with newer things and then playing with the things and then putting the things down and then getting more things and wanting other things, wanting someone else's things, thinking that the things better than their things. But what a lot of psychology is looking, what a lot of psychologists are looking at, and there's a new field called positive psychology that says those things don't really make us all that happy. And ironically, they make us less happy than if we didn't have the things. And I'm not referring to food, water, shelter. Um, but beyond that, and this this, uh, this picture up here is like an oldie but a goodie, it's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And a man named Abraham Maslow said that, um, that we start when someone is need, you don't have food or water, you can't breathe, you're probably not going to be worried about um, whether your life has meaning, but as the lower needs are met, we move up to meet higher needs. And, and I looked, and I looked over this, and I noticed that, that, um, that watching last night's episode of Glee is nowhere on the list, nor is PlayStation, um, makeup, fancy cars, nowhere on the list. Um, what those things do is, is they, they replace temporarily some of these actual um, physiological or psychological needs. So as we learn to cope with life beyond consumption, or a life where we might be forced to or strongly encouraged to consume less, it's theoretically and psychologically possible that we will become healthier through an increased sense of well-being by finding the things that really do make us happy and by developing a sense of collective efficacy that we can work together to solve problems. Um, so there are some positive impacts that we can think about. It's not all doom and gloom, unless you think that the paper about a PlayStation is doom and gloom, in which case we should start working on alternative fuel sources. Um, so next we're going to talk about adaptation and coping with perceived threats. How do we, um, so we've, we're being impacted, how do we adapt and cope with this threat? What, in, what encourages somebody, knowing what we know, to do something about, to respond to threat? So we talked about perceiving a threat, why we might or might not perceive a threat, climate change threat. And the next step is appraising. So I know that something is going on. I watched that Al Gore movie. They mentioned it on the news once or twice. And now the next step is to decide whether I'm going to respond or not is to appraise that situation. So this one possible, uh, one theory of appraisal is called protection motivation theory. And protection, motiva protection motivation theory is first applied to health behavior settings. And, um, and the idea is that we appraise both threat, how much of a threat something is, as well as our ability to cope. And whether we perceive something as a high threat and we have the ability to cope, that appraisal will determine whether or not we respond or engage in the response. So um, if we sense that something is a great threat, and like I said, this was at first applied to health behavior. So for example, um, if I have, I don't know, if, if, um, if I'm going to the beach and I'm not sure, and, and we want to know if somebody's going to wear sunscreen to the beach or not, or if we're going to do something about keeping their um, skin clear from, um, from potential dangerous UV rays. Um, it depends on whether they think that there's really a threat of being in the sun. So if I look outside and think it's kind of a cloud today, I'm probably not going to get burned today, or I'm only going out for half an hour, um, or really, like, what are the odds that one day at the beach, I really want to take a chance of going on vacation, one day at the beach really isn't going to give me cancer. Like, that takes 20, 30 years of prolonged exposure. So, what, so if I don't really perceive that this is a great threat, I might be less likely to engage in that behavior. In addition, um, I need to have a sense, I need to assess my ability to cope or do something about that threat. So, if I think, well, yeah, that's a big problem, but I don't have any sunscreen, and I'm meeting my friends in five minutes, and I can't do 
late. Parker makes the beast look really bad. Um, I don't really like putting it on. It makes my hands sticky and I hate that. I don't have any handy wipes and I brought a sandwich and I don't want my eggs out to taste like, like uh, what's that called? Sunscreen, thank you. Like sunscreen or I don't know. I don't know how to put it on. I can't get it on my back. Whenever I put it on, I always miss a spot and then I have this weird little dark spot and I hate that. It looks funny. So if we don't think that we're going to be able to cope, we're also less likely to engage in that behavior. So really, our ideal situation, if we're looking uh, for people to respond, if we want someone to put on that sunscreen, is for them to sense to have a high threat appraisal and a high threat appraisal, which is, I think it's important for me to put on the sunscreen, because if not, I might get cancer and or have to be wrinkly later in life, and I know how to do it and I'm able to do it. And if I know how to do it, and I sense that there's a reason to do it, then I'm theoretically, rationally likely to put on that sunscreen. If I feel, if I sense that there's a high threat, but low coping, so I really think that like this is a big problem, but I don't feel like I can do anything about it, the response might not be behavior, it might be anxiety. I'm just gonna get really stressed out. I'm gonna go to the beach with no sunscreen and be really unpleasant all day and freak out about it and make my friends miserable. Um, or I might, I might have a high sense of coping, like sure, I could put on sunscreen, but why? I don't need to. Like I have natural dark skin tone. I would never say that. I do. Um, I like sunscreen. But that person might think, sure, I could put on sunscreen, but why? Apathy. And of course, if we don't sense that there's a problem or a threat, and we don't think that there's anything we need to do about it or can do about it, then we're just kind of indifferent to the problem at all. So in a rational, theoretical, ideal world, this would be how we make decisions. In addition, the decisions that we make can be either individual or collective. So there are individual responses, putting solar panels on one's own home, or a collective action, I can join with other people. Um, and these are not pictures, just that we can do both. And then of course, preparedness and response. So putting on that sunscreen before versus dealing with going to the doctor and maybe getting them all removed later. Um, or when it comes to um, natural disasters, of course, there's preparation kits versus dealing with the responses. But, um, so then we're gonna look at psychological barriers to action. So we talked about the rational response, how we appraise threat, and are most likely theoretically in a calculating, cognitive way to, to deal with, um, with any sort of threat. But the truth is that we're not always rational. We are often not rational. Rational people maximize utility in all cases. Everything we do, we walk around thinking, what is the benefit of this? What is the cost of this? What is the benefit of this? What is the cost of this? And we make our decisions based on that calculating of benefits and costs of all of our actions. And the truth is that we're, we don't really do that. We have a lot of little shortcuts that help us make decisions. Because if we had to think about every single decision, it might be hard sometimes to even get out of bed certain days. We really don't make these decisions. We make decisions not as individuals. Often decisions are made socially by groups, contextually, they're made for us. We're not always, we don't always have all the correct information to make a decision. Um, we often have habits or emotions involved in our decision making processes. So, um, so there are a lot of things that go on. We're not, we're not really, oh really? I didn't know I was gonna take that. Um, so we're not always rational. And a lot of, um, a lot of our irrationality, however, we're not completely irrational. There's a man named Daniel Ariely um, who wrote a book recently called Predictably Irrational. And he's in a field called behavioral economics, which is basically um, economists using psychological theory to study decision making. Um, and he wrote a book called Predictably Irrational. And he said, we're not always rational, but, but we are predictable in certain ways. And, and this field is based largely on the works. We could have sworn I had the slides about them. Where did those slides go? That makes me so sad. We lost three slides. That's okay. Um, they were good ones, too. So, uh, so, it was his, so this field of behavioral of economics is based on the work of two men named Tversky and Kahneman, and they actually won a Nobel Prize for their work, and, and they said that there are these things called heuristics, and heuristics are like rules of thumb, that there are these behavioral kind of shortcuts that we go through when we're making decisions, and I'm just going to talk about a couple of those shortcuts. Um, 
an example of what possible barriers are to this rational protection decision-making process. So one of them is called anchoring. And, um, and this is actually, um, this is from the Economist website. This is a couple years ago. This was a study that, that Daniel Ariely did. And he saw this and he thought, this is really interesting. But the Economist gives these three options for um, subscription. So there's a $59 option, which is just online only, economist.com. You just read online content. There's a print only for 125, or you can get print and web for $125. And that's the exact same price as the print subscription, which kind of makes it look like a good deal to a lot of people. And so that was really interesting. They made the print subscription, the print and web subscription exactly the same. And one of these services is called anchoring. And that means when we have multiple choices, we have a tendency to, to compare, to prefer comparing the two that are most similar. It's also called asymmetrical dominance. That, um, so this $59 is really different than these two 125s. But I compared these two 125s pretty similarly. And obviously, the print web is a much better deal. So given these three options, and, and in the first part of uh, Professor Ariely's study, they found that 84% of people chose the print and web subscription. Given these three choices, this seems like the best choice. Um, but then he said, what if there wasn't a print subscription? What if people just could choose between this economy that online only and the, and the print web of 125? We were just given two options. What would, um, would 84% of people still make that choice? And what he found was that um, they didn't make that choice. The numbers changed. 68% chose the online only subscription, whereas only 32% um, chose the print and web. And so you look 84 to 32%, that's 52%. That means that um, if these numbers could, could predict actual economist.com subscriptions, the economist, 50% of people who subscribe to the economist spend twice as much money as they would otherwise because of the presence of a third anchor, of a third option. So these, these strange little heuristics, now theoretically, rationally, the presence of this option should not have any effect on whether you want the print subscription or not. If you don't want it, you don't want it, right? I don't want the magazine. It's bad for the environment. But it's free. Look, if I get the print, it's 125, and this is such a good boat, such a good deal. Duh, I of course want to get it. But it might not be what we would otherwise choose. Um, another example, um, another common heuristic, or two common heuristics are um, loss aversion and the endowment effect. And these are really interesting. Um, they're the two ends, two sides of the same spectrum. Um, things that we have, the endowment effect says, once I have something, I endow it with much more value. So we value something we have much more than something we don't have. And if I don't own it yet, then getting it is less important because it's a gain. So constantly, so we value losses much greater than gains. And we value things that we already have as being much more valuable than things that we don't have. That might not make sense, so here's an example. Um, this was another, um, another, another study. Students were given um, university mugs, and they said, they gave them these, these cute little Cornell mugs, and they said, how much would you be willing to sell this mug for? How much do you think this is worth? Would you like to sell this mug for? And then the other students were asked, how much would you be willing to pay? for one of these mugs. So what is the valuation of this mug to you? What is this mug worth? How much would you sell it for and how much would you? And they were just dumped and half the people were given the mug and half the people weren't. Um, and, uh, and the mug, you might say, if you had to give anyone a mug, what is the value of the mug? And, and it should be about the same for all, for all the students. Um, and, uh, and what ended up happening is that the students who had the mugs valued them twice as much as the students that didn't. So the students that had the mugs said, I would sell this mug for maybe 450 by box. Like this mug is my mug, it's not gonna sell for nothing. Um, and then the students without the mugs really weren't willing to pay that much for them, about half. They 
like you know, it's kind of weird. Like these students didn't want mugs; they just kind of given mugs, right? Um, what about something that somebody wants? Does it really look the same? And there was a follow-up study conducted with basketball tickets, Duke basketball tickets. And uh, at Duke, so when they when they make the finals, I think, for all basketball games, especially when they make the, when they make the finals, they have a lot for tickets to the games. It's like all students, anyone who wants to take one slot. And so um, Dan Ariely got his hands on that list, that lottery list of people that were in it. And some people got tickets and some people didn't. And they all wanted the tickets, they were all in that lottery. So he went immediately afterwards and said to all the people that got the tickets, he said, how much would you be willing to sell these tickets for? And then it was everybody who didn't get the lottery, who didn't win the tickets and said, how much would you be willing to pay for these tickets? And uh, lo and behold, about the same thing happened. The people who had won the tickets wanted about twice as much for them as the people who um, didn't, who, who hadn't gotten the tickets. And, um, and they said very different things. And what was interesting was he asked them, why? Why do you think it's worth it so much? Why are we not? Why? And, and everyone focused on, on what they had. The people with the tickets said, he said, how much would you be willing to sell these tickets for? Like, why is that? Because the once in a lifetime game, like, oh, this is an experience that I would never have otherwise. I don't want to give that up. It costs a lot. It would take a lot of money for me to give up what I have to these tickets. And then there were people that didn't have the tickets and said, How much are you willing to pay? And they were like, oh, 50, 65, And they said, Well, why is that? And they didn't talk about this once in a lifetime opportunity. They said, Because it's a lot of money, you know? Like, it's just a game. I can watch it on TV. It's no big deal. So really, when people were asked, they focused on what they had rather than what they didn't. Um, so these barriers are really interesting, and I just picked a couple. Um, there, there are a lot more, and they all clearly have implications um, for climate change, which we'll talk about. Which is intervening. So understanding, so now that we know a little bit about how we understand climate change, how our behavior contributes to climate change, what um, some of the different contextual and psychological drivers of those behaviors, um, the impacts of climate change on us, and then some of the rational and or irrational ways that our behavior is affected. What are things we can do? And there's a few strategies that we can look at um, that have great potential for, um, uh, for psychologists to help in promoting um, climate resisting or climate mitigating behavior. One is called framing. And framing, it's really important how something is said has a large impact on how people respond and whether people respond. Um, so for example, the words that are used have a huge impact. There was a, um, a really recent, a really interesting study where they found that, that people were twice as likely to be willing to pay a carbon offset for a future flight than a carbon tax. 65% um, of people were willing to pay a carbon offset for a future flight. And I think it was 32 percent, 32 and 33 percent were willing to pay a carbon tax, um, which is really interesting, especially because carbon offsets and carbon taxes are exactly the same thing. There is no difference between a carbon tax and a carbon offset, other than the fact that one has the word tax in it. You don't like that word. Yeah, hold the word tax. Have you done your taxes yet? I haven't. They're too soon. April tax day. Tax. Offset. Offset's a little bit less unpleasant. We like offset. Oh, offset. Oh, offset my. I'm using this, so I'm going to offset my use of fossil fuels through this tax. No, no tax. That's confusing. Pick one. I say offset. Um, so other ways we can frame. Make something tangible. So this is a great, I think, example um, of a well-framed message. Give examples, make it tangible, use high-impact words. Um, so every year, the Earth goes out 400,000 tons of recyclable paper. I don't know what 400,000 tons of recyclable paper looks like. Oh, I do now, because that's enough to fill the Empire State Building. And this is an ad in New York, right? So people in New York have some sort of understanding of how big the Empire State Building is. It's really big. You know, that's what it would look like if it was made of and or filled with paper. Um, and so making it tangible, giving this example, this visceral example that you can look at and relate to, enough paper to fill the Empire State Building. 
And it's kind of framed in terms of losses rather than gains. It's your city, it's your earth. Protect what you have. As opposed to prevent this bad thing from happening. Um, so framing. And there's a lot of opportunities for framing. There are other examples of framing as well. Framing in terms of, we talked about temporal discounting, framing in terms of immediate impacts as opposed to future impacts. This could have an impact today or tomorrow as opposed to in 20 years. Framing in terms of individual versus collective impacts. So there are lots of framing possibilities. Defaults are another great, um, great example of how we can use psychological insights. Um, and one of these heuristics that we didn't talk about is kind of just called status quo bias. We tend to go through life without kind of in the middle of the road. We don't like to make a lot of changes and and the path of least resistance, for the most part, is the path that the vast majority of people will take in a given situation. So how governments set that path will have a large impact on how people behave. For example, these are actual organ donation rates of, um, of all, what was that, 11, 11, what did they do, 12 countries? What did they do this? I just said 11, 11 countries in Western Europe. And these are their actual organ donation rates in, I want to say, it's published in 2003, I think 2001 rates. And it's interesting to see that, like, for example, Germany and Austria are close neighbors, culturally possibly similar, but Germany's organ donation rate is 12%, whereas Austria is about 100%. Now, there could be a lot of individual variables that affect that. Maybe Germans are bad people and Austrians are really nice. It's one hypothesis. Um, but it could also be that, that the status quo, the middle of the road, path of least resistance for organ donation is different in Germany than it is in Austria. And that's in fact the case with these countries. Um, the difference between these countries is that in the countries on the right, the default option, if you are born, go through life, and then die, and you never fail or get me into the government, we're gonna take your organs. That's the default. If you don't want it, you don't want us to have your organs, that's totally cool. Just fill out this little thing and send it into the government, and we will leave your organs alone, and you can do whatever, or you'll be dead, but your loved ones can do whatever they want with them. The other countries, and America is an opt-out, is an opt-in country. Say, if you're born, and you go through your life, and you don't ever do anything, and you die, we are not going to take your organs. We do not have your permission, unless you fill out this little form and send it in. In both cases, it is totally up to you whether you don't have your organs or not. It's not mandated in either circumstance. But participation rates are significant. Just based on what the default, what that path of these resistance is. Social norms. Um, this is a hot area in psychology right now. Um, this seems like it would be a really great advertisement. Um, it says, did you know that cigarettes are the most commonly littered item? Don't trash California. Everybody, everybody's throwing their so cigarette butts on the ground, and it's awful. Don't do that. What's interesting is that there's there are two messages going that being being given to you here. One is that it's kind of gross. It's a gross picture. Like, don't trash California cigarettes are gross. But the other message that you're getting is everybody else does it. Everybody does it. Everybody throws cigarettes on the ground. It's normal to throw cigarette butts on the ground. If you smoke, if not, it's just weird. It's why do cigarette butts in your pocket? That's crazy. But if you do, everybody throws them on the ground. So you should, you shouldn't. But it would be normal to do so. And so, um, so social norm researchers would say that, um, that this is not a very good ad. And and one gentleman named Robert Charles Kinney had that hypothesis and decided to test it um, in the 90s. Not with cigarette butts. They went to a national park in uh, it was Arizona. And, um, and they looked at the graffiti. I think it was graffiti or litter. And they saw a sign that said, people always litter here, please don't. 
and they just stood there watched for a while and looked at him from the transcript. Someone didn't throw it down. And then they changed the sign to say, this park is beautiful. No, it's taking fossils. This is what it was. It was taking fossils from the preserve. And it said, every year, it was kind of like this message, every year lots of people take these fossils and they want to put them in. And they looked at how many fossils people took. And then they changed the sign and they said, we have all these fossils. Nobody ever takes them. So you shouldn't either. And then they found it. And they found that, that the message should the message just said, everybody's taking fossils, and in a few years there's going to be no fossils left. Like, please, give up a fossil. Please. Didn't work. But the other message that said, there's an abundance of fossils because people just like you don't steal. That was very effective. So this has really changed a lot of the way that we promote stolen remnants of behavior because this used to be very common. And now instead we're seeing more messages like this. Join your neighbors in conserving energy. How do you measure up? How much do your neighbors conserve? Do you conserve as much as them? Nobody throws cigarette butts on the ground. It's gross. You shouldn't either. And we're finding that these messages are a lot more impactful. Um, lastly, um, is, uh, is another I want to throw in. It's another one of um, the primary areas that I work is on feedback and energy conservation. And this man, Alan Kempton, said in um, in the, in the early 90s, he said, imagine if you went to the grocery store and you just walked down the aisle with your cart and there were no price tags for anything at all. So you could just put food in the cart and go home and eat it. And then, at the end of the month, instead of getting this receipt, you got a receipt that said, you consumed 1,527 food units this month and here is your bill. And you're like, that's expensive. I need to save money. But you have no idea how much things cost. And Alan Kinsman said that's exactly what our use of fossil fuels is like. We have no idea how many kilowatts we're using when we use electricity. We have no idea how many carbon, how many tons of carbon went into our t-shirts or our hamburgers. None. So the idea of translating that, giving us information just like at the grocery store. We get price information about our food, we get nutritional information that's regulated by the government. What are we giving people information about the energy emissions? So, right now, this is what we get the bill at the end of the month. And that's only electricity. We don't get that at all the products we buy. We have no idea the number of kilowatt hours or the number of gallons of water that went into the kinds of things we purchase. So, um, there is this huge area looking at how we can give information. How can we give you information? about the um, environmental impact of these, of these big things. Um, and then, um, and, and if we can compare this in relevant ways, so if, if we frame, this is kind of combining a few things, if we frame, um, frame something in a way that people understand, so the average US only uses about 35 kilowatt hours a day of electricity, which is about the same as a double bacon cheeseburger. So if we frame this as, the average person uses the equivalent of 35 double bacon cheeseburgers a day, and then we give you information on how much you're using, possibly allow you to compare with others in your neighborhood, then we might really be able to provide properly framed, um, socially normative feedback, information about our use, and theoretically, things like this will help us make better decisions. So that was just a small um, sampling of psychology of some of what I think are the interesting areas in psychology and sustainability. But, um, but the point is, is, that, is that there's a lot that we can do and can study. Um, and it's up to all of us to decide what we're going to do with that. So thank you. Thank you. 